Welcome, 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 friends. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, weird history, and occasionally we get the absolutely fabulous opportunity to interview some authors, and that is what we have today. I'm so excited. This is our very first fantasy author that we have interviewed, and I cannot wait to introduce you to her. Her name is Aparna Verma, and she is the author of the Phoenix King. So please welcome me. It's so nice to have you here. I'm so excited. We have uh, negotiated a time between two countries. Uh, Where are you at right now? (laughs) I am in Baltimore to the States. Nice. Uh, as as you know, I am in Japan. Um, yeah. <laughs> where I've yeah. been for a very long time. <laughs> so I actually found um, Aparna on Instagram and mm-hmm. came across the book, The Phoenix King, and thought that it would be another fantasy book that I would add to my purchase list. But unfortunately, it was not out yet. We still have to wait very, very soon. August 29th, uh, Mm -hmm. my birthday, Aparna's birthday, uh, the best month in the whole year. The whole year. August is the best. Leo is like, conquer the world. Come on. Yes, exactly, exactly. So we got a very wonderful opportunity to interview her before the book comes out and get a little bit of a sneak peek into what the book is about, characters in the book, and inspiration behind the book. And I'm just, I'm so excited to get started. (laughs) So could you tell us, this is a fantasy book. The Venus King is a fantasy book Mm -hmm. based on some mythology. And it's very different from the fantasy books that have been coming out recently, like the Achilles song and a lot of Greek and Roman and Western Um, mythology. So could you tell us a little bit about The Phoenix King? Yeah, so The Phoenix King is an Indian inspired epic fantasy, but it's also, I would say like sci-fi fantasy. So it's set in a futuristic desert kingdom called Ravens, um, where the Ravani live. And the book follows the ascension of the um, heir, Alina, to becoming the new Phoenix King. That's the name of the title of the throne. So when people keep asking me, it's like, wait, the female, the main character is a female. Why isn't the Phoenix Queen? I was like, child, it all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> <I swear. laughs> no, it, it's really funny because when um, when my uh, publishers, you know, um, at Orbit, like the, when they, you know, were punting the title around with me, um, we were like going like, should, should we call it the Burning Queen, the Phoenix King? And we're like going back and forth. Um, and then when my editor told me, that, you know, the Phoenix King, she's like, it has like big book fantasy energy. And I was oh, like, you know God. what? I agree. It does sound so <laughs> uh, And you're right. It's not, um, it, it, it's kind of different from the other grains of like fantasy that's more so inspired by um, Western mythology. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's more so inspired by Indian mythology, specifically Mm -hmm. the goddesses um, Mm -hmm. and the warrior goddesses like Ma Kali and Durga Ma. And so Mm -hmm. for me, I really wanted to explore in the book one, um, some of the concepts of female rage that Mm -hmm. the Western world doesn't quite capture in their books well. I, you Mm -hmm. know, and what I so far yeah and the reason i say that is because in hinduism especially when we look at the stories especially of makali um we see that her anger that her quote-unquote rage is not something that should be feared well it is something that should be feared. let me correct that it is (laughs) something that should be feared but it's also something that's necessary because it was her Mm -hmm. anger her rage her power that cleansed the world and saved it from the demon Rak the Beach. So in our stories in Hinduism, you realize the necessity for female mm. rage and how women, when they're angry, are not monsters, they're protectors, mm. they're mothers. 
And so that really was something I was play, you know, I play around with in the Robbins trilogy, which is, you know, the name of the trilogy and in the Phoenix King. And so, which I have right here. <laughs> it's so pretty. Very glossy and very thick. She is, she is thick. thick. And thick. I love it. <laughs> so hopefully that answered your question. I feel like I, I said a lot. <laughs> no, that was a, a absolutely wonderful explanation. Um, in in terms of like the female rage being more cleansing than destructive, I really mm -hmm. love that idea and bringing it into the fantasy world. Taking because I've I've never seen another fantasy book that has like the ideas of Hinduism and that type of female rage, not a yeah. destructive one, but one of like necessary protection. Yeah. Protection. Exactly. Yeah. That is so fascinating. Have you always been interested in mythology? Yeah. I love myths. I feel like, you know, they're my jam. Like I can, I love reading myths and folklore from all around the world. Um, mm -hmm. I think when it comes to personally my writing, the world building, the, the mythos of like creating a different world, that's where I feel like I really shine because mm -hmm. it's something that I just live and breathe mm -hmm. on my own, like, you know, just personally. Um, one of the, I, one of the fav most of my favorite classes that I took when I was at Stanford was this mythology class where we had a British mythologist like he was like a, a guest lecturer. Like he came over from England and he told us the Odyssey orally with a song drum. And it was the most, and it took like you couldn't take you couldn't do it all in one class, right? So it was like a span of like multiple classes. And we like and it was the most magical experience. And then actually we had a talk with Martin Shaw. And then Madeline Miller, who wrote, who Cersei had just come out. So they did a talk yeah. together at Stanford. And I was fangirling the entire oh time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jealousy is just pouring oh. out of my body right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like that moment, that class really told, like, I think we, you know, I think in the back of our head, we understand that myths are universal. Mm -hmm. But I think some of us still believe that myths are myths. Like they're not real. They're part of the past. Mm -hmm. They're not present but i truly mm -hmm. believe that our myths our folklore is something that constantly interacts with the present constantly interacts with us no matter how progressive or scientifically advanced we are you know our stories still live and breathe and affect us and so i when people tell me like you know it's it's mythology not history i kind of refute that because Absolutely mythology not. is history exactly no way a thousand percent we at for the love of history yeah. completely agree with that everything is history history yeah. is not just what happens in our textbooks history yeah. is all things that humans create humans interact with so mm -hmm. Uh, I remember in our email thread, you were worried a little bit that the the book is a fantasy book yeah. instead of being like a, a historical fiction. And I was like, absolutely yeah. not. Come. Yeah. We love that here. <laughs> the, we, we do mythology in this place. I actually have a, a series that I do around Halloween time talking about uh, Japanese myths and Ooh. yokai and legends and stuff. So this is just like a, a I like icing on the cake. I absolutely I love, love it. it. So I want to ask you, has... Indian mythology always been a part of your life or did you discover it later on in university or how how did that go for you in yeah, your life? Well, I, I grew up raised as Hindu. I'm a practicing Hindu. And mm -hmm. so um, I was always surrounded by Hinduism and Indian mythology. Hmm. Uh, and it's really funny. One of the only stories that my mom would tell me and like, she refused to tell me any other story before bed uh, <laughs> was the Ramayana. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Ramayana is like one of the most, like other than the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, well, there's so many, but like the, mm -hmm. the Mahabharata and Ramayana are two of the greatest epics of all time uh -huh. um, and are constantly in conversation in the subcontinent. Mm. And so my mother would only tell me the Ramayana and I know <laughs> it like, you know, the back of my hand. And uh -huh. uh, I was sometimes get upset with my mom. I was like, can you tell me another story? Like, I already know how it is. She's like, no, this is the one and only story you have to understand. <laughs> and I kind of want to thank her because <laughs> I think uh, being raised with that story, the Ramayana, I think it teaches a lot about sacrifice and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, 
which aren't readily apparent. I also think it teaches a lot about self-respect and self-worth. Mm. Mm. Uh, Typically how Sita Ma at the end of the Ramayana when she's like, you know, banished to the forest mm -hmm. and then she's given the opportunity to redeem, quote unquote, redeem herself mm -hmm. in front of the court again, despite already being innocent, takes the decision to leave. You know, um, she calls on, on Mother Earth and uh, and she goes back to her mother, who who is the Earth. And when I was a kid, that always bothered me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know, so in the ending of the Ramayana, um, after Ram defeats Ravan, um, what happens is that Ravan had kidnapped Sita, and Sita had mm -hmm. been living in his palace for a while. And back in in that age, like if a woman if a woman lived in another man's house, it's like she's kind of sullied, or mm -hmm. what if he had touched her, you know? Or, you know, it was like a, a speck on her reputation, mm -hmm. and so. Ram, who is the king, had his own, like, you know, when his subjects started to talk about it, he had to do something, you know, like he, um, and he, there was a test for Sita where she had to walk through fire and she passed it, you know, so she Ooh. was, she was innocent. And like, people are like, oh my God, like, look, she proved her innocence. Like she was not burned. However, um, and I think this is something that a lot of affects Indians today is that, mm -hmm. and, and one, I think, and there's many versions of the Ramayana, so yeah. some people may have heard a different account, but the way I was like raised and learned from is that there were townspeople who were still talking about how could, you know, Ram bring Sita back into his home after she had lived in another man's home. You know, she was kidnapped. She was yeah. not. Right. It wasn't like she was just going over to the dude's house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was kidnapped against her will. And, you know, and so Ram, and then there's this a beautiful book called The Forest of Enchantments by Chitra um, Banerjee. Mm -hmm. And it beautifully captures Sita's psyche and that moment uh, where uh, the reasons why Ram banishes his wife even though he knows she's innocent he is the king and when subjects he he's like you know dependent on what the subjects want a saying in hindi called lokya genge mm. which means what will the people say mm. still goes to this day of like you know <laughs> what if you do something wrong it's like lokya genge like you know what would they talk you know our honor our reputation our family's honor so it's still a big part of you know the indian culture the indian mm -hmm. psyche like even here living in america for me yeah uh, and so what beautifully happens and i i really recommend people to read first the ramayana and also chitra's book is that when sita is given the opportunity to return she understands that you know she takes a stand you know mm -hmm. she's like i have been disrespected i have been loved i've been disrespected but you know at the end of the day like i will not suffer through other people's judgments, their, you know, um, misjudgments. Mm -hmm. And she takes a stand and decides to go her own way. And to me, that really shows like, you know, she was a warrior. She was always a warrior. Uh, but I think like as a kid, because she was kidnapped, because she was in prison, I thought she was weak. Mm -hmm. uh, as I got older, and I started to revisit the story, I realized just how much strength Sita had. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so beautiful and it still applies to how i look at female figures how i write female um mm -hmm. and character you know characters in my book of how even the ones who may may not have like positions of power they are still powerful yeah they still have their quiet strength yeah uh, and i really have to thank my mom and the Ramayana for teaching me that you know <laughs> Yes, yes. Let's all thank your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because now we have this beautiful book that we're all yeah. going to read on August 29th together simultaneously. <laughs> well, you were talking about um, bringing that perspective of power into your female characters. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the characters in your book? Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> one of my, I can't choose between my babies but okay. <laughs> we all know like you. always has a favorite yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. it's very true and actually one of my favorites um who i love dearly is firma firma, uh, firma is uh alina's head guard she is Ooh. her spirit and firma is actually a yumi and a yumi is a species in the world where 
the women have long, beautiful hair that can mm -hmm. sharpen knives. <gasps> that is so cool. That is, yeah. I got goosebumps. I just <laughs> got goosebumps. Isn't it amazing? So and like their their hair can cut. It's like the strongest like kind of material that can cut through flesh and steel. It's the only. There's this one other kingdom called Jantar and or Jant. I'm sorry, Jantar, where if you their steel is like the most powerful and the you know, strongest in the world. But the only thing that can beat Jantari steel is a Yumi's hair or anything made from a Yumi. And so uh, I really love Firma. She, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's so many books where it's like old gruff male protector who takes on young knave, <laughs> you know, and we love those yeah. stories. Yeah. I love those stories, you know, they're great. Uh, they're great. But I really wanted a story where it's a strong female friendship between two powerful figures. Yeah. And, you know, there's this misconcept uh, that, like, you know, when there are two powerful women at the room, they're at each other's throat. You know, mm -hmm. like, they're, not, they're always at odds. They're always competing. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to sh showcase, one, a strong female friendship because we don't get to see that a lot in fantasy. Yeah. Uh, right? They're always, like, competing or mm -hmm. like, manipulating or plotting. Yes. But Firma is Alina's best friend. Mm. She, yeah, she is her mentor, her mother, her friend, sister. You know, she's always been in Alina's life. And mm -hmm. she has really taught Alina about bravery, about patience, which Alina is still not good at. <laughs> um, it's okay. We learn. We learn. We, we don't learn. Forget. Exactly. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, one of my favorite scenes that, you know, there's a lot of great quiet moments that I love in the book that are actually my favorite. It's not like the big battle scenes, the quiet mm -hmm. moments between the yeah. characters. And there's this ritual, especially in India, called Del Malish, which is like when your mother usually puts like on Sundays, and I would hate it, <laughs> where she would like rub coke, hot, like, you know, warm coconut oil into my hair. Uh huh. Uh, it helps. And now everyone, I do it all the time. It makes her hair yeah. go faster like and longer. On TikTok. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Health years. Everyone's going back to it, right? Yeah. Um, but um, it's just part of growing up. I always had that. And it was such a very like a bonding moment with my mom. Mm -hmm. We would talk, we, you know, we would discuss about school, about life, um, joke around. And so it's not a Theo Malish, but Alina is giving like Firma, like almost like a, like a massage, like a head mm -hmm. massage and starts braiding her beautiful hair. Mm -hmm. And it's a really quiet moment between the two of them where, you know, Firma is this, is this figure of power and like also mm -hmm. like weapons, like, you know, like her mm -hmm. hair can instantly like cut through. But because she trusts Selena, her hair is like soft and silky. Uh, so they have this beautiful moment where they're talking and discussing something that I won't reveal. <laughs> but, it, but, you know, like it, it's such a beautiful moment between them. And I, I just I love it so much. Oh, that's am amazing. I love that. I mean, we haven't read the book yet, but I love that it seems like you've put more dimension into female characters than there, there has so. been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that there's both sides of Firma as the warrior, but also that soft side that we saw in that little glimpse of in the book. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. So we talked about your favorite characters. Were there any characters while writing the book that you were just like, this person is so terrible. Like, I kind of <laughs> don't even want to write what you're about to do right now because you yeah. just suck. Like, how how were the, the villains or the not so favorite yeah. characters in the book? I I feel like all of my characters misbehaved, except Firma. Firma was my, my, you know, my true golden child. <laughs> she, <laughs> she never misbehaved on the page, but all of them did. Alina, Yasin, Leo, Samson, like they all mm -hmm. misbehaved. I will say uh, one of the, the, the characters who I am surprised that I end up pulling off, hopefully mm -hmm. I pull off, <laughs> <laughs> is Leo, who is the tyrant in the book. Mm. You get to see the story. He's, all, he's the father. He's her father. But he's also the tyrant. And he's not exactly a man who plays by any morals other than his own. Ah. You know? Got it. And it's interesting to me because if he was alive today, he would, I mean, he's a, he would be a dictator. You know, yeah. like if he was a real person, uh, he would be a dictator. Um, mm. 
you know, has this, you know, who misuses, you know, religion to boost his power. He has cronies, political cronies, who have some of the citizens in in Ravens like afraid to speak up. Mm. And to me, he was one of the hardest characters to write. It was is because like he's had he has such a, I would say, complicated and terrible history. Mm -hmm. But he also comes from a place of protection, as mm -hmm. misconstrued as it is. So all the characters, you know, come to like they're always trying to protect something, yeah, uh, for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. And for Leo, he's trying to protect his kingdom as well as his daughter. So, uh, and this is something like you know from the back of the book. Um, there's a prophecy that gets revealed um, in the first. 50 pages of a book. Yeah, so it's not a whole, not a spoiler. <laughs> and, um, it's okay, we'll take what we can get. <laughs> yeah, the, the prophecy foretells that the the prophet of the phoenix, who is the the god, or, or sorry, the goddess of, you know, R Robins, will rise again and take back the kingdom. Mm. Now, there is debate where Leo thinks that, you know, his ancestors are the one who found the kingdom by the mm -hmm. blessing of the phoenix. So he's, so he's always, you know, there's a portion of the story where he's like, is this prophecy even true? Because we were the ones who were blessed, supposedly, mm -hmm. by wow. the goddess. Mm -hmm. uh, and Leo himself is not a believer. It's, you know, he has struggled with his faith for a very long time. And he's come to a point where he sees faith as a, a weapon mm. to strategically to win the hearts of people in his favor and so writing a character like that where he's protecting for his daughter for his kingdom while mm. also killing a lot of people on the way you're kind of like ah. <laughs> so i for me i always strive to like never part like you know pass judgment on the book or, or sorry mm. on the characters like mm. in the writing itself. like i want my characters to appear and just be and i think the judgment is up to the reader mm. you know my book was i had self-published my book first as the boy with fire like you know mm -hmm. ages ago yeah well not ages ago 2021 it's not that long ago <laughs> ages it feels like ages <laughs> um and it's funny because i i would get reviews and it's interesting to see like people like who's was their favorite character some people would say yes and other people say alina other people will say leo and i'm like leo <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, it's not why, but I'm just kind of like, wow, like mm. that's really interesting to me. Um, surprise, yeah, yeah. I was just, I would just be surprised, and I think um, it's like when characters who are dynamic, it's like the the religious villain, you know, yeah. where it's like they're coming from a place where you would think preach, preaches tolerance, preaches acceptance, mm -hmm. preaches kindness, but somehow in their own psyche, like you know, they manipulate it to. Uh, justify their actions and to them they're never doing anything wrong so to me that was like the most interesting thing to untangle with mm -hmm. with leo's because he always thought his actions though may not be good were always mm -hmm. correct got it what is that um chaotic neutral or evil neutral yeah. or something <laughs> like that <laughs> we will land somewhere there yeah Got it. That is so fascinating. I, I'm so excited to meet these characters in the book for real. And yeah. it seems like, so from what you've said so far, it seems like you've pulled inspiration from a lot of different places. So yeah. um, Indian mythology and where else, where did you get the inspiration to write these characters and write this book and create this entirely new world? Yeah, I, I feel like for me, there was not just sources that I can pinpoint. Mm -hmm. I think the way that I am as a writer, I'm always, my writing is almost an amalgamation of what I've read and what I've experienced. Yeah. So like, say a character like Yasin, um, mm -hmm. he is mixed race, mm -hmm. but a white passing in the book. So mm -hmm. he's both the money and the body. Okay. And that proves problems for him one because he was raised in robbins and mm -hmm. he doesn't look like a ravani he looks jandari which is the enemy and so he would always get ridiculed as a kid he would always be bullied and his parents would always you know be ridiculed as well of like of entering you know a uh, interracial marriage ah which you know communities today still have problems with uh, yeah. 
unfortunately. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Right. So um, it's I am not mixed race, mm -hmm. but I have always felt like I lived between the edges of identity. Mm. And that's something that literally a, a line from the book. <laughs> you know? oh. I, think, I think it's like Another the edges, sneak peek. <laughs> yeah, the edges um, of the world where like, I always think that people, if you're an immigrant or if you're mixed race or, if, or even, or if you're ever straddling two different mm. communities, yeah. You know, you're not you're a part of both, but you're not entirely in one. You're kind of like the middle of the Venn diagram. Yeah, and yeah. you're always, you know, seeking acceptance. You're always trying to find a home. Yeah. So for me, that was a very personal journey because I feel like I'm still on that journey mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, like being um, Indian in America, right? Yeah. Like I, if I go to India and I speak in Hindi. Everyone's like yeah you're you're from america you have i can speak hindi fluently but they're like yeah you have an accent they like, know oh, grammar's wrong like that yeah. you said that word. i'm like yeah. i know i'm sorry <laughs> i'm a fraud you know? no. <laughs> so, and then if i come here you know it's it's just so obvious it's just like oh you look different you know mm. like what, what are mm -hmm. you doing no one will ever say hopefully what are you yeah. doing here but hopefully. you feel you feel it you feel the eyes you feel, you feel the, the judgment you feel the questions right mm -hmm. you always feel the questions yeah yeah when the underhanded well where are you from kind yeah. of thing which nails on a chalkboard oh yeah. i hate that when people yeah. ask that so do you feel that writing this book was kind of cathartic for you like a way to express those feelings yeah so when i like i have been wrestling with this book for 11 odd years you know wow. um but it didn't really come into fruition until 2020 you know when uh -huh. the pandemic happened everything was shut down i felt like i was in a dark place because uh -huh. i felt trapped i felt stuck which i think a lot of people experienced right yeah. I, I don't i'm not alone in that mm -hmm. i felt alone in that mm -hmm. you know um and the book was a lifeline oh, you know good. i mm -hmm. have never written something so fast like i wrote the, it was then the boy with fire in drafted in like four months oh wow insane, insane. i don't think like, i could i don't know if i could ever pull that off again. stephen king in it up in here just yeah. writing things so it quickly was, holy cow it was insane and then you know it took the next year year and a half to like edit and revise and all that but uh um, wow. the drafting process was so quick and i think because i was there was we were all inside there was nothing else to do really yeah. but also i feel like there's was, there was so much darkness in the world mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. and a lot of political leaders were using that situation for their own gain. They're manipulating nationalism, they're yes. manipulating religion, they're manipulating, ex you know, political ideologies, and, mm. and it's all for the name of power. Mm. And that's something that's very concretely in the book, where like you see it in Leo, you see the trappings in Alina because she mm. is his daughter. Mm. And so it, it felt cathartic because I was, discussing those ideas with myself as i was experiencing them in the world mm -hmm. uh, but i also think i i love a, a story of hope you know i love a yeah. story of romance you know because i was you know i have a romantic heart and so <laughs> um, it, it was it was nice to get, bring a little bit of hope into that story yeah. uh, also could be very very dark well just like life absolutely yeah. just like life in a lot of ways I mean, the pandemic was awful and it continues to affect people's lives yeah. to this day. But I feel if I'm very much a find the silver lining in everything kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like it. And if if anything can be said of the pandemic, it really gave people the space and the feelings to be able to create art mm -hmm. just yeah. like your book and in that very 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 small way i am thankful for that opportunity that mm -hmm. came through the pandemic wish it never happened however yeah. Yeah. i'm glad that beauty can be found from such a terrible incident so or not incident the global pandemic <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in your, you were talking about, re, uh, you wrote a, you self-published a book yes. called The Fire. 
The Boy with Fire. The Boy with Fire. And is that, should we be reading that before we <laughs> read The Phoenix? Oh, no, it's the same story. I get this question all the time. And I feel like I should put like a FAQ on my website. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but it's the same story. So The Phoenix King is The Boy with Fire. Got but it. newly revised and 30,000 words longer. Oh, so wow. <laughs> I wish I had a copy. I do. It's like on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. But like if you compare The Boy with Fire to The Phoenix King, this she's thicker like you know the phoenix king yeah. is thicker there's a, a new book. bonus chapter yeah Ooh. it's a there's a bonus chapter there's a prologue now Ooh. uh prologue, prologue i guess yeah prologue. sure whatever yeah whatever. as you can see english is not my first language so <laughs> i'm slowly uh, forgetting english as i am spending more and more time in japan so it's fine that's awesome. <laughs> so like i i had self-published it but it's the same story just longer and i think it goes more in depth um so I wouldn't, you, it's not necessary to read The Boy okay. with Fire. It might be better to read The Phoenix King and then go to The Boy with Fire and see the changes, you know, Got it. that it happened. So <laughs> you have such like a detailed picture of this world and these characters in your head. Like, how do you organize that? How do you navigate that and keep that straight? Do you like, are you a sticky notes kind of gal? Like, how do you do this? Well, I wish, I wish I had, um, back in like 2020, 2021, like my, this wall of my room was covered in sticky notes. Oh my God. And so I, because it was multi POV, I would have like each sticky notes, like chapter one. Yes. Chapter mm -hmm. two. And then once I was done, I would kind of rearrange oh. the sticky notes. It's like, oh, this chapter should go here. This should go there. I'm like, oh no, this should be Leo's chapter instead of Alina's chapter. And, and so I am a very visual person. And so. Wow. It was really helpful to have everything out on a sticky note wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Signal wall. laughs> Arrange that. But to me, what's really interesting is that their voices, Leo, Alina's, and Yasin's, were all very distinct in mm. my head. Mm. Uh, there are moments when they blur, and there's a reason. Like you'll see in the narrative, it was like, hi, she's kind of like some, this is something that I feel like Leo and Alina would agree on. Got it. You know, or like even Leo and Yasin would agree on. <sighs> and and I, I like that. I like those moments when like if you know if you read a little bit deeper, you'll see that. I always believe in rewarding the reader, where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the reader who reads closely and who kind of minds because I was an English major. And so like I like I get so much more out of a book when I'm like mm -hmm. closely reading. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's like little I kind of hopefully this in theory, that's what I did. But let's see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people read deeper you'll see those little moments where you're like oh shit like this is a leo moment in a leo <gasps> chapter you know like you know Not so it. like kind of like the characters are rubbing off on one another yeah. just like in real life you know you start when you spend a lot of time with people you realize oh, you pick up their mannerisms you pick yeah. up what they're saying yeah exactly that kind of thing oh my gosh i am have I said that I'm excited about this book? Because yeah. I feel like <laughs> I've said that a thousand times. Oh, look, we'll have to like send you. I, I, I'm sure like you've already pre-ordered a copy, but hopefully though it can send you an arc in Japan. I don't know how that will work, but I I'll talk to my publicist love that and it would <laughs> literally make my entire life and mm -hmm. at the risk of giving everything away uh to, to the listener right now um maybe we will uh stop giving away tidbits of the book yeah. and i'll ask my final question for you today so while you were creating this book what was the most like fulfilling moment for you all throughout the process of drafting of looking at the cover art of anything what was the moment where you were like oh, oh my gosh like this this is my book or your most uh, favorite moment there there's a lot of pinch me moments mm -hmm. you know i would say um a lot of like author bucket list or what you would say core memories you know mm -hmm. that i've like snapshotted and filed away in my heart um, yeah i think one of the most special is that you know i constantly get these beautiful heartfelt dms from mm. past readers who've discovered the phoenix king or read it as a boy with fire or are currently reading like you know early copies mm -hmm. um of the book and they share like just how much they connected with the characters how they felt seen how they felt represented mm -hmm. uh, 
how they didn't see the plot twist coming or <laughs> <laughs> you know and so uh, but i think the biggest moment was when um so i think this was in the fall of 2021 so the boy with fire had just come out august 31st mm. actually <laughs> so both in August, August. <laughs> yeah and um nbc did a feature oh. on the book uh i think what the, the the station in washington dc did one mm -hmm. and they found tiktoks from readers who had read the phoenix king oh. and they put it together in like one of you know in one of their like tv packages they had interviewed wow. me and they also so you know on to the television you see you know readers you know um brown readers indian mm. readers reading the book either dressed in traditional clothing or you know dancing to or like you know having a um a, an indian like background music mm. and so like, we're all on the screens and we're being celebrated and are we're being seen and that to me was like this is no longer about me or about my book it's about mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. uh, and that that just felt so powerful of like and i remember the, uh, i was i i messaged some of the creators who were you know spotlighted they were like this is so cool i showed my mom like this is I'm okay. and that to me that was like a really cool moment where i was like like dang like that book that little book did that yeah you know? Uh, the little book that could <laughs> the little book that could that it's so beautiful i've got goosebumps like <laughs> bringing tears to my eyes thank you so much for spending time with us oh, today so sharing happening. yeah it was absolutely wonderful sharing your inspiration sharing the mythology behind the book and the characters and august 29th cannot come any sooner i'm so oh, excited <laughs> yes so close and i will put all of the links to aparna's book where you can pre-order her website all of her social medias in the show notes uh so you can check that out and pre-order yourself a copy of the phoenix king so that we can all read simultaneously on the 29th <laughs> go 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 Thank you so much. And I will see uh, you in the outro. Okay. Thank you, Perna. Thank you so much for having me. Well, dear one, that is all we have for episode 200. Nope, absolutely not 200. <laughs> episode 102. I hope you enjoyed this fun behind the scenes look at the upcoming book, The Phoenix King. Aparna is just an absolute wonderful human being. I'm so glad that she agreed to come on the podcast. And don't forget that you can pre-order her book using the link below. It comes out on August 29th, so it's coming out in just a few weeks. And don't forget, if you are not in a position to buy her book, you can go to the library and request for it to be purchased by the library which is also a super great thing to do to support authors. And speaking of support, if you'd like to support the podcast, please consider leaving a rating or review. It helps the algorithm gods know to bring other history lovers or potential history BFFs into the space where this podcast is. <laughs> You can also join the History BFFs over on Patreon. There are some fun exclusive things that we do over there. Bonus episodes, sleepy history podcast episodes, merch discounts, behind the scenes of the book that I'm trying to write, and so much more. But again, no pressure. Your support in any way is incredibly appreciated. Our season is almost over. We've got two more episodes and maybe chunk maybe a bonus episode so let's soak up every last second of for the love of history season six that we can and with that i will let you go but not before telling you to do something that makes you happy be kind to yourself this week take good care of yourself please drink your water and i will see you next week okay love you bye